We're so glad that you're with us here today. We are so glad today that Caleb Raymond is going to be speaking for us, a student at Southern Adventist University. Really thrilled with that. We're going to begin with a passage of scripture and a prayer. This is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. 
For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we are so grateful this morning that we have been perfected in one offering, Jesus Christ. We stand perfect before you, not because we are good, but because he is good. And Lord, we are grateful that this overflows into our lives and sanctifies us and we grow and become more and more like him. So today, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit, that sanctifying spirit, would come down upon us. and That we would honor you in our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go to There's it. this interesting phenomenon in physics where sound vibrations in one object can cause a nearby object to produce sound if the original sound is produced at just the right frequency or pitch. All material objects have what is called a resonant frequency, which is the natural frequency at which it vibrates, and a sound wave oscillating perfectly at the object's resonant frequency will cause it to start vibrating spontaneously. If, for instance, you were to hold down the G note on a piano so that the string is free to vibrate, and then you plunk the G note an octave below it, the vibration of the lower note will cause the higher string naturally to sound even though you didn't strike it, simply because the lower note is vibrating at the higher string's resonant frequency. A note that is sounded at the resonant frequency of a crystal goblet, if it's loud enough, will cause the goblet to vibrate so much that it shatters. This is called sympathetic vibration, and not only does it make for some fascinating science experiments, it also provides us with a vivid analogy for an aspect of the Christian life that is absolutely vital but often overlooked, something called sanctification. Sanctification refers to the process whereby Christians become holy. It is about acquiring and living in holiness, and the Bible is quite clear that this is essential to the Christian life. In one place it says it as bluntly as can be, that without holiness no one can see God. The challenge here is that often the language of holiness conjures up for us images of somber people who have a long list of things they do and don't do and who feel they need to impose this list on everyone else. But this is not how the Bible conceives of holiness. The Bible continually describes it as something that God does in us and through us as he claims us for himself and works his holiness out in us. In one place it says it like this, May the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. In this sense, holiness is an objective characteristic or quality that God imparts to those who belong to Jesus, not a subjective quality that we obtain through moral effort. We are, in one sense, passive recipients of our holiness. And yet at the same time, holiness is, in fact, about a way of life. It is about men and women actively thinking and speaking and living in a way that reflects God's own holiness. In one place, the Bible says we are to present ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. In another place it says we are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Well, these two pictures of holiness, that it is something we passively receive, but also something we actively pursue, can be brought together, perhaps, if we think about it with the analogy of sympathetic vibration. Because in sympathetic vibration, the sounding note is at just such a frequency that it causes the adjacent object to vibrate spontaneously. And at the same time, there is something about the nature of the object that it will vibrate if it meets a sound wave at the perfect pitch. Our holiness is a matter of our sympathetic vibration, so to speak, with God's own holiness. The sounding note, you might say, is the Holy Spirit. And because this note is indeed a perfect pitch, perfectly conveying to us God's perfect holiness, when it comes into contact with our hearts, passive though they may be, it causes us to begin vibrating in sympathetic harmony with Him. That is to say, our thoughts and words and deeds take on the character and the quality of His thoughts and words and deeds. In this way, we are altogether passive in our sanctification and yet deeply active as we live in harmony with his holiness. Or as the Bible says it, we will be holy because he himself is holy. Amen. Amen. Privilege that is for us. Good to see you guys this morning. Things are filling up a little bit more in here for those of you at home. And uh, glad to have you there as well. Hey, let's praise this God who does such amazing things for us through himself. Sing out with us.
When I see the beauty of the sunset's glory, amazing artistry across the evening sky. When I feel the mystery of a distant galaxy, it awes and humbles me to be loved by a God so high. What can I do but thank you? What can I do but give my Thanks, Howie. Again, welcome this morning. We're glad that you're here at the Foster Church this morning. We're certainly glad that you're viewing on YouTube today. Uh, we just have a few headlines for you this morning, and we're going to begin with a prayer list. Uh, just going to tell you some things that we need to be praying for, and then we're going to take a moment this morning in worship just to pray for those. First of all, Rose Cannon, you may know her better as Shelly's mom, is in the hospital in Atlanta, and we certainly want to uplift Rose and let her know we're thinking about her. Ken Lance has been back in the hospital uh, Linda Brown's brother um, is at, what has been at mission and um, certainly we want to pray a great prayer of Thanksgiving today for Linda and David who are celebrating their 45th anniversary today. 
uh, 45 years. It's, uh, it seems like it's just been overnight, hasn't, doesn't it, Linda and David? And Linda's arm still. Uh, Cherie Wells' sister-in-law, Wendy. Um, Judy Van Eyck's surgery, uh, still recovering and recuperating from that. Uh, of course, Betty Gray's surgery, recovering and recuperating from that. Jesse and Jurgen Schmidt, um, we want to uh, pray for them, especially uh, Jurgen this morning. Uh, Brenda Clark continued healing. Yvonne's, uh, Liana, Liana Wolf's mother's friend, Yvonne. Uh, Beverly Rourke, many of you know Tom here at the church. Beverly Rourke is, uh, has had a couple of strokes. And we just want to remember all these things in prayer today. And certainly we want to pray. Some of you may not know the whole story, but some of you may be privy to it. Uh, we are so grateful that Bell is back today. Um, Bell is a, a puppy that was lost this past weekend, uh, 4th of July, last Saturday, with the fireworks. And uh, Bell was found just a couple of days ago. So really praying for that. Let's lift these things up to God this morning. Gracious Father, we are so grateful this morning for the privilege that it is to come to you in prayer. We, we get to come to your bold throne boldly, not because we're good, not because we're perfect, but because you're perfect and you impart that perfection to us. You're holy and you come and live in us and you make us holy. You grow us into holiness. Um, Lord, we're just coming boldly to your throne this morning. And all of these names that we've mentioned here uh, today, all the way from, from Rose to Bell. We just put them in front of you and we say, Lord, thank you for many good things that you've done, for rescuing Belle and Linda and David's 45 years and the healing that we have seen in our church. Um, some of it well nigh miraculous. We're grateful for that, for that, Lord. But we also present to you our petitions, our heartaches. Uh, Lord, we are grateful today that you hear each one of those and we want to lift those up to you. In the Old Testament, Lord, people would come into your sanctuary with just bearing lists and put those in front of you. And that's what we're doing here today. We put this list in front of you and we pray, Lord, hear us. Hear us from heaven and act on our behalf. Um, whatever, Lord, happens in any of these instances today, our trust is completely in you because you're the only one who's trustworthy. We know that you're going to do the right thing at the right time, no matter what it is, Lord, that comes upon us in this world. We know that you're trustworthy, and we put our trust and faith in you today. So thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. I uh, just want to bring another couple of things to your attention. Uh, many of you know that over the winter we had a waterfall in the um, attic of the Thai school room. It was just uh, flowing down into the, to the uh, attic up there. And uh, we decided at that point that we were going to put on a new roof. Uh, that went through several weeks of debate and um, discussion. Uh, the church board finally um, moved to replace the roof on the teen room, on the port cashier, and on the old kitchen. And uh, you'd just be surprised how much uh, a roof will cost these days. Um, we actually ended up kind of delaying the, the process there a little bit to be sure that we were all on board, that we were doing the right thing. Uh, but we actually have now come up with a $75,000 uh, plan, $76,000 plan to replace all of these roofs. Because of your generosity, because God has been moving in your life, he's a generous God, and when a generous God lives in a generous people, those people become even more generous. Because of your generosity, because of what you do from week to week, we have been able to allocate those funds without taking out a loan on those things. Uh, you know, in the Bible it says at one time, uh, Joseph in Egypt, there was this dream that Pharaoh had, and it was seven lean years came up after seven fat years, and the lean years, the lean cows, ate up the fat cows. And Joseph said those are, those are fat years where things are prosperous, and those are lean years when things are not. And um, we've been putting that money away in what we call a contingency fund. And if you get the church email, if you'd like to sign up for that, you can do that. But the contingency fund is where we took $46,000 of that money. Uh, we've been salting it away because we know that things like this are going to happen. The contingency fund we generally keep at roughly three months operating expenses for this church. So if there's a catastrophe that happens, we will be able to go on business as usual in this church for three months. Um, that fund went from $75,000, $75,568.72 in 2017 
In one fell swoop, it went down to $29,093.72. So what we're going to ask for you to do is between now and the end of the year, when you're doing your church budget offering, we're going to ask you to go ahead and pay your church budget as you all are doing, amazingly doing. It's just incredible to me how generous uh, this church is. Um, not just for church budget, but for people who've been in need over the past three or four months. It's just incredible what you do as a church. Uh, we're going to ask you to maybe put in just another dollar or two into the contingency fund. We're going to ask you to market contingency fund roof repair. And we want to get that back up to where we have three months operating expenses in the bank so that if anything happens, uh, we can handle that. Uh, I think that's uh, enough said about that. Just amazing that we're able to put on those roofs uh, just without borrowing a dime. It's just, isn't that wonderful? It's just wonderful. Um, I think that that's all that I have today, and I have something here from APCS Day Camp. Uh, Caleb is going to come up, and we're going to have some slides this morning. Is that on the agenda? Where are they? Here he is. You want to give me a hand wipe there? He's wired. He's wired. Go for it, Caleb. Caleb Raymond. I am the worship director for the APCS Kids Camp, and this is Katie Robertson. She is the assistant to our director, Jake Miller, um, who unfortunately is not here today. He had some business to attend to outside of state. Um, but we would just like to talk to you guys a little bit about what's happening over at APCS. Uh, Jake Miller came to me early in the summer and was like, hey, bro, um, you want to start Kids Camp? And I was like, yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> and so he got to work. Jake has just done absolutely amazingly. And I don't know about Katie or our arts director back there, Nicole, but I have had an amazing summer getting to spend some time with kids, getting to share the love of Jesus, and to just have a lot of fun. Uh, but unfortunately, this next week is going to be our last week. But we are going to go out with a bang. That means bigger games, bigger crafts, bigger science experiments, bigger explosions in science. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'll keep your kids safe. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> but what, I, what I'm trying to say is next week, if your kid has not come to kids camp yet, next week is the week to do it. One, because it's the last week. Two, because it's going to be absolutely amazingly fun. Um, what was that? Foster members get 50% off. Foster members get 50% off. Now, if that isn't a deal, I don't know what is. <laughs> also, if you bring your kid on Monday and you sign up for the entire week, you will get 10% uh, off for it as well. Um, we have flyers in the, on the table right outside in the lobby and also in the lower lobby on the table down there, I believe is where it is. Awesome. Um, so if you want more information, you can grab one of those, or you can go on our Facebook page, APCS Kids Camp, or our Instagram page, and shoot us a DM if you'd like some more information, or um, you can come talk to me afterwards, or Katie, um, and we'll give you some more information, give you Jake's number or our numbers, and keep you in contact. So if it's something that you guys would be interested in, um, those are the avenues of which you can pursue it. Thank you guys so much, and happy Sabbath. Thank you, Caleb, for that. And we're uh, so ha happy that Caleb is here today to share the word of God with us. Caleb, we're going to be praying for you as you speak this morning. So uh, preach in season and out of season. It's time now for a children's story. We're going to ask Pastor Courtney to come up. All right. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Kids, you're going to have to stay at your seat today. I, we usually on children's Sabbath have kids do songs with us, and it's so much fun. So we're sorry that we can't do that today. But I have a story, and actually, uh, Pastor Patrick already mentioned it a little bit. This week, our friend Isla and her little sister Eloise, I know many of you know the Schneffers, Catherine and Greg. And um, this past week on the 4th of July... They had a dog sitter because they were out of state visiting um, their uh, grandparents and family in Oregon. So they were way far away. And they had a dog sitter. And this dog sitter had a fence. And it was like the first day that Belle was there. And she got startled by this firework. And she somehow either scaled the fence or wiggled herself through. And she went missing. 
Now, my neighbor actually breeds Labradoodles, and so it's a lot of fun. We get to play with a lot of puppies. And so this dog is actually from her, and they have this little program where you get the dog, but then you get um, to get a discount, and then you can for five litters. So she'll have five litters of puppies for the breeding program and then go back to their house. So that's who Belle is. So she also um, is connected to our neighbor. So I found out, my neighbor called me at like, or texted me at like 9.45 and said, Belle is missing, I'm gonna go look, out, look for her. Another detail is my neighbor is seven months pregnant. So I went with her to try to help look for Belle. So from Saturday night, 4th of July, until Thursday morning, we were searching and looking and calling shelters and posting flyers and our Facebook shares. I know probably almost all of you in here have shared that on Facebook. Our, the church post got over 3,000 shares It was amazing how many people came together to find this sweet, sweet puppy. And so it just felt like every day that went by was a little more worrisome, a little more stressful, a little more, boy, what's going to happen? And at one point, I think one of the girls was saying, why, and my kids were kind of wondering too, why is God not answering our prayer? Why do we not have Belle? Why isn't she back? Why haven't we found her? And so then somebody spotted her outside of their yards by the woods. And so Catherine ran there. And when she saw Belle in the tree line, she sat down and she sang to her. Isn't that sweet? She sang to her. So she sang to sweet Belle and Belle came to her. And that was that. She was found and rescued. And it just was so beautiful because it not only shows how wonderful God is and how he does answer our prayers, but it also shows how much he cares in that that was a puppy. That was a puppy that we cared so much about. We spent all that time and energy, especially Catherine, all that time and energy and love into a puppy. So how much more does God love us? How much more does God search for us every single day of our lives? God is searching for you every single day in the same way that we were searching for Belle all week. One verse that I sent during the week that I want to share with you, and I like the contemporary English version a lot, so that's why I've got it on my phone here, is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. I'm going to read that to you now. My prayer is that God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ will be kind to you and will bless you with peace. I never stop thanking my God for being kind enough to give you Christ Jesus, who helps you speak and understand so well. Now you are certain that everything we told you about our Lord Christ Jesus is true. I know that for my kids, and I'm guessing for Island Eloise, they know that that's true more than ever after this week. You are not missing out on any blessings as you wait for him to return. And until the day Christ does return, he will keep you completely innocent. God can be trusted. And he chose you to be partners with his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you so, so much for caring about us. We love Belle, and we're so thankful we found her. And God, you are a God that answers prayers. You care about the little ones. You care about children, and you care about our little prayers and our big prayers. God, we trust in you and ask, a, ask that you be with us this Sabbath day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. And still looking forward to you kids getting back up here. That's going to be a, a, a fun day when we can all be up here singing again. For right now, sing out loud there, home or here, wherever you happen to be. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness and new every morn. How sins they are men, his mercy is more.
What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam? What father so tender is calling us home? He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins they are many, His mercy is more. What riches of kindness He lavished on us. His blood was a payment, His life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, His mercy is more. So much more. So Lord sins. There's so many, and his love is just greater than any of that, any, anything that we could ever imagine. And his, he has all these loving characteristics, you know, like his kindness, his, his, uh, just his love and, and care for us. And he wants so much for us. And that leads to just this amazing grace as well. And we're going to sing about that next. The grace that, that we certainly don't deserve, but he has just lavished on us. Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now. was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace the hour I first Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my 
you all to to kneel with me this last song we're going to sing as a prayer and uh, I'll let us all sing it out This all my precious 
shall be more love, oh Christ, to thee, more love to thee, more love to thee, more love to thee, more love to thee. Then shall my latest breath whisper thy praise. This be the parting cry my heart shall raise. Still on my prayer shall be more love, O oh Christ, to thee. More love to thee, more love to thee, more love to thee, more love to thee. More love to thee. Still all my prayer shall be. More love, O oh Christ, to Thee, more love to Thee, more love to Thee, more love to Thee, more love to Thee. Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath. Good morning. You guys have an absolutely beautiful state. Did you guys know that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is the first time, or I guess second time, that I've been to North Carolina. First time was right in the middle of quarantine, so I didn't really get out much. Um, but I've been out a little bit more often now. My drive to work every morning, there's like this beautiful fog that's just set over the entire state, and I see just enough of the trees and the fields to just brighten my day. And my drive back from work, there's no longer a fog, and there's no clouds, and all I see is beautiful, gorgeous mountains. Two weekends ago, me and my friends went on a hike to Catawba Falls. If you guys haven't been there, you should go absolutely stunning. I am so, so happy to be here in this beautiful state of North Carolina and in this beautiful church right now, sharing the word of God with you guys. Um, before I start, let's say a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for being who you are and displaying the love that you have shown to each and every one of us every day. God, I pray that you come into my heart and everyone's heart that is sitting in the pews or watching online, and may we open our ears to you. And for me, God, I pray that you make me just a nail upon the wall holding your picture into, on, on the wall. Lord, please, when I open my mouth, let my words not come out, but yours. Yes. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. amen. A while back, a woman in Kenya was going on a walk. She was the founder of the Tonza Ch Children's Center in Ngong. And she was just going for a morning stroll with one of her colleagues. And she looked into the forest and she saw a group of monkeys. Nothing unusual. Um, but upon closer inspection, she saw what looked to be a young child with the monkeys. Strange. 
So she walked a little closer, she took a little bit more time in inspecting what she thought was a child, and she came to the realization that that was indeed a child just chilling with the monkeys. She thought, that's probably not the best place for a child, so her and her colleague got some food. Um, well, first, they tried to take the, the child from the monkeys, but the monkeys weren't having it. They would chase, chase the woman and her colleague off, and so they, they decided that they were going to go grab some food and see if they could distract the monkeys. So they grabbed them some bananas and some bread, and they put it out by the monkeys, and the monkeys got completely distracted with that. Their entire focus was on feeding themselves, leaving the child alone and defenseless. So the woman and her colleague grabbed the child and took her to the child center that they had in Ngong. They named the young woman Charity. Um, and I, I watched a few videos on this young woman. Um, they don't know how long she was in the care of monkeys, but long enough that she adapted monkey society. When they would give this young woman food on a plate, she would take the plate, throw the food on the ground, throw the plate away, and eat the food off the ground, because that's all she knew. In the video that I watched, she was crouched down like a monkey in the corner with her whole hand in her mouth, sitting there for comfort. When, it, when a person would approach her, she would screech like a monkey would. And upon further research, I, I found that this was not a one-of-a-kind thing that happened. A woman in Colombia by the name of... I have my sermon on my phone, by the way. I'm not checking Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> a woman in, in Colombia by the name of Marina... Chapma, sorry if I butchered that name, she lived in the jungle with monkeys for five years, or around five years. She's not entirely sure, because, you know, no clocks. Um, <laughs> but she lived in the jungle for up around five years. Now she is a grown woman living in Colombia. She has, I think, two books out on her experiences. And I, I watched an interview with her where she talked about it. She said how when she was running with the monkeys... Um, they would find berries or fruit, and the monkeys would go for it first. She had to learn how to, how to fight for her food. She had to fight monkeys away so that she could get food. She learned how to communicate with the monkeys in a way that the monkeys screeched if there was danger or let out these happy noises. The interviewer asked her if she could give him the danger warning, and I'm not going to do it for you. I'll spare your ears. Um, but let me tell you, it sounded exactly like monkeys sound. Incredibly, incredibly interesting. And then there was a boy who wandered onto school grounds in Uganda. Crouched by a tree, the headmaster came out and to find his entire class just surrounding a tree with a young boy, completely unclothed, dirty and scratched, walking around on, on fours like a monkey, screeching and swatting at the other children, terrifying the other children. When the headmaster tried to, tried to take the boy in, he would just not have it. When they tried to wash the boy, it took four grown adults to wash the boy because he would just keep on flailing. He was terrified of water. You see, these three children were all living in a false reality. You see, they, they thought that what they saw in the society around them was all that there was, right? Their entire identity was placed into the reality that they were shown. And I want to talk about that, but how that happened to me. You see, when I was younger, I don't know if I was just not getting it or if the devil was just working really hard to try and distract me, but I could not understand Christianity. I had this false reality that I believed in that completely warped my view of the gospel. I have it written down here so that I don't, so that I don't mess it up. I always struggled with the fact that we are called to live a perfect life and to emulate the life of Christ. As a child, I would hope and wish that I could live as Christ lived. And I'm not saying that's not what we should be teaching our children. What I'm saying is I wish someone taught me that's not only my responsibility to bring my character to that point. You see, the mindset that I had is that I needed to achieve perfection on my own. And because I had that mindset, I identified myself as a failure, because I would fail at achieving perfection. 
the reality around me taught me that humanity was flawed and imperfect, which is true, but that's all it taught me. And so I was left with this idea that here I am, a broken, no, good-for-nothing sinner, and, and what am I going to do about it? So I tried. I tried so hard to be good. I tried so hard to be perfect. And every time I would slip up, the devil would attack me. And even now, when I slip up, the devil attacks me. And I know that everyone in this church knows exactly what I'm talking about. Where you make a mistake and you look in the mirror and you say, mm, Caleb, come on, man. Are you really this, this low? Are you really this dumb? Are you really just going to continue on doing this, doing that? And it, it destroyed me. It brought me down. I was living in a false reality, and so I identified as a failure because that's what the reality I was living in told me. And then one day, my reality switched. I was working at a summer camp in Maryland, Mount Etna Summer Camp, and I was, I believe I was a uh, maintenance man there at that point, but I, I, was, I was sitting down on a bunk bed, and I got in a conversation with one of my friends, Ben Williams. He's now in seminary at Andrews, got hired at Hawaii. Sorry, I'm going off on a tangent. I, I do that a lot. Um, but, but I was sitting on a bunk bed having a conversation with Ben Williams, and Ben Williams asked me a question, and he said, Caleb, are you perfect? That pricked a vein for me. I was like... Of course not, man. <laughs> I, I, I'm human. I'm not perfect. I, there's nothing that I can do to make me perfect. I'm just, I'm just trying to be the best that I can be. So then he asked another question. Okay, well, Caleb, do you think if God came right now, in this second, would you go to heaven? I was like, well, I hope so. I mean, I love the Lord. I pray to him. I hope so. And Ben said, but you're still identifying with your sin, aren't you? You're still not saying that you're perfect. I was like, well, that's because I'm human. I can't be perfect. And Ben said, well, that's where you're wrong. And he opened up the Bible to Hebrews 10, 14, which reads in the NIV, I believe, for by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And in that moment, I felt like a child that used to be squatted in the jungle, surrounded by monkeys, seeing another person for the first time. And everything that I had ever learned about Christianity made sense at that one point in time. You see, I've started doing a little bit more research now that I've grown older and have this new understanding. And I found someone in the Bible that gets it just like I did, that got it and had a realization of revelation just like I did. His name is Paul, and it used to be Saul. On the road to Damascus, God opened up his eyes and showed him Hebrews 10, 14. I don't know if he actually showed him that, but I like to think that. <laughs> you see, Paul understands it. Paul wrote in Romans 8, verse 1. Follow along with me if you can. Say amen when you got it. Amen. Paul wrote in Romans 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that righteousness the righteous requirement of the law may be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to spirit. You see what me and Paul before the road of Damascus and before Ben Williams for me and we're doing, we were living according to the flesh. We were looking 
on what exactly we were doing. We had this like idea that outwardly perfection was what we needed to achieve. We needed to go to church every Sabbath. We needed to, uh, I don't know, not play basketball on the Sabbath. I saw religion as a, as a list of do's and don'ts that were just impossible. How can I, I not lie? I, I said I didn't eat the cookie, but I did. Something so simple, but I mean like it's literally in the Ten Commandments. When I look at a Ferrari, I'm like, hey, that's a nice Ferrari. I want it. Boom. Jealousy. Covetousness. How can, I, how can I stray away from this sinful nature that is so deeply rooted in my flesh? But Paul says that the flesh, oh, it doesn't matter anymore. Hallelujah. Because Christ came. And I know I'm not the only one that struggled with this idea, and I know that because it's been a struggle for the church ever since it started. In the very beginning of the Christian church, when the Gentiles started to be converted to Christianity, you had two sections, converted Gentiles and converted Jews. And the converted Jews were holding on to the law, saying, this is what got you perfection. This is what got you salvation. They claimed that you could not be saved if you were not circumcised. Obviously, the Jews were circumcised, the Gentiles weren't. And Peter, what a, what a lovely man Peter was, he struggled with it too. In Galatians, I think, uh, in Galatians chapter 2, it talks about a story of Peter sitting and eating with the Gentiles, the uncircumcised people. These were people that believed in Christ, that believed that Christ's sacrifice was meant for them as well. And he sat with them and he ate with them and he was communing with them. But it says when certain people came, meaning the Jews that believed in circumcision, Peter distanced himself from the Gentiles and sat with the Jews because he was afraid that he would be judged by the Jews. Paul even says that Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. And so Paul does not sit around and watch this happen. Paul calls him out. And Paul says in Galatians 12, going back a little bit, for before certain men came from James, he, Peter, was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with them, so that even Barnabas was led astray in their hypocrisy. They thought that circumcision was what you do to gain salvation. I look back at that now and I'm like, come on, guys. You know, that doesn't really matter all that much. But just a few years ago, I thought that keeping the law to a T is what got me, sir, uh, is what got me salvation. And when I wouldn't keep the law, I would identify myself as a failure and think that I just wasn't worth anything. But Paul speaks out against Peter in Galatians 2.19, and he says, For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by, by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And this is, the, is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, Galatians 2, 21. And it's so powerful. Paul says, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. We know that Christ died. I wholeheartedly believe that. And so if I believe that, then I must know that righteousness is not through the law. It is not through what I do. And the more I learn this, the more I let go of the idea that I do something to gain salvation for myself. The more I let go of the identity that I'm a failure, because what if I'm not judged by what I do? And Paul talked about this again in Philippians 3, verse 4. If you, if you can read along with me, that'd be great, because this is absolutely beautiful. Paul talks about having confidence in what we do. He said, he called out the entire church, and he said, if any of you have confidence in the flesh, I have more. In Philippians 3, verse 4, it reads, If anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, 
As to the law of Pharisee, meaning he kept the law to the T, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, he killed Christians in the name of God. As to righteousness under the law, blameless, but whatever I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Anything and everything that I or you can ever do to attempt to gain our salvation, Paul says, is just straight up trash compared to what Christ has already done for us. And I think it's because the devil tries to attack us and tries to make us self-conscious and pray on our insecurities and say, oh, you're not good enough for God. You're not good enough for heaven. And you'll never be good enough for heaven. And you know what, devil? You're right. <laughs> you're right. But praise the Lord that I am not the say-all, end-all. Because if I was, woo, big, trouble. big, big trouble. The reality that I used to live in was one that told me I had something to do with my salvation, was one that told me that I had to work incredibly hard for it, and every time I would fail, I would hate myself. But the reality that I live in now is stemmed exactly from Hebrews 10, 14. I think that verse perfectly encapsulates the gospel. For by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So church, I am no longer Caleb the liar. I am no longer Caleb the sinner. I am no longer Caleb the unworthy, but instead I am now Caleb the perfect. Because Christ has made me perfect, and I will proclaim that my entire life, and I pray to God that you guys will also proclaim that. And I don't think I need to speak anymore because that is it. We are perfect. And before you leave today, I want you to say this to yourself. And I'll say it right now. Lord, thank you so much because I am perfect and I'm on my way to holiness. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of your son that you've given us. Thank you so much for reminding us that it is not us that gains salvation, but we find it in you. God, thank you for cloaking us with your perfection so that we may identify as perfect. And God, lead us on the path to holiness. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Amen. In the desert, you are with me, your love has made me new, grace is poured out like a Yeah.